I want to begin by reading from Romans 15 and a little bit from 16, and uh, then we're going to get into talking about this. From Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, Paul says these words, We who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. Now, what things is he talking about? Well, the very things that I preached on last week. So if you weren't here last week, you can go listen to my sermon online. I don't have time to rehash all that. But Paul talks about a lot between the strong and the weak. So go refresh yourselves on that by reading 14. But Then he says, we must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't have to please, didn't live rather to please himself. As the scriptures say, the insults of those who insult you, O God, have fallen on me. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promise to be fulfilled. May God who gives this patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That sounds really good, doesn't it? Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jew to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. He also came so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. That is what the psalmist meant when he wrote, For this I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. And in another place it is written, Rejoice with his people, you Gentiles. And yet again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Praise him, all you peoples of the earth. And in another place, Isaiah said, the heir to David's throne will come and he will rule over the Gentiles. They will place their hope on him. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Then jump down to verse 23, chapter 15. But now... I have finished my work in these regions, and after all these long years of waiting, I am eager to visit you. I am planning to go to Spain, and when I do, I will stop off in Rome. And after I have enjoyed your fellowship for a little while, you can provide for my journey. But before I come, I must go to Jerusalem to take a gift to the believers there. For, you see, the believers in Macedonia and Achaia have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. They were glad to do this because they feel they owe a real debt to them, since the Gentiles received the spiritual blessings of the good news from the believers in Jerusalem. They feel the least they can do in return is to help them financially. As soon as I have delivered this money and completed the good deed of theirs, I will come to see you on my way to Spain, and I am sure that when I come, Christ will richly bless our time together. Dear brothers and sisters, I urge you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to join in my struggle by praying to God for me. Do this because of your love for me given to you by the Holy Spirit. Pray that I will be rescued from those in Judea who refuse to obey God. Pray also that the believers there will be willing to accept the donation I am taking to Jerusalem. Then by the will of God, I will be able to come to you with a joyful heart and we will be an encouragement to each other. And now may God, who gives us his peace, be with you all. Amen. And then chapter 16, verses 17 through 20, Paul says, I make one more appeal, my my dear brothers and sisters. Watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you have been taught. Stay away from them. Such people are not serving Christ, our Lord. They are serving their own personal interests. By smooth talk and glowing words, they deceive innocent people. But everyone knows that you are obedient to the Lord. This makes me very happy. I want you to be wise in doing right and to stay innocent of any wrong. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Is anybody in here, anybody else besides me, rather, fascinated by architecture? Anybody like looking at buildings? 
or is that, am I just weird? Okay. So a few, a, a few of you like, like that. I've always enjoyed architecture. Now, I am not an architect, right? I don't understand how architecture works, but aesthetically, I enjoy it. I especially love, that's why I've always loved going to big cities. I love seeing the different architecture, the tall buildings, how they continue to stand after dozens and even hundreds of years, right, that they're still there. And for thousands of years, right, there are structures still standing. We can go to some of these places that Paul himself visited thousands of years ago, and there are still structures standing, at least partially, from that time. It's really quite amazing. I don't understand how it works, but I know that for any structure to stand for a long time, it has to have a good foundation, right? It has to have a good foundation. Now, I did a little bit of research. I, I, I wanted to, to, you know, again, I like skyscrapers. I like tall buildings. So in New York City, the Freedom Tower, we all know the Freedom Tower was built after the, you know, the attack on 9-11. Does anybody want to guess how deep the foundation goes for that, for that building? Anybody ever heard? It goes down 70 feet underground. So seven stories of concrete and foundation go down into the ground to make sure that that building can stand tall for a long time. I found that really quite amazing. Now, I knew it would be deep. I wasn't thinking 70 feet deep. That's really deep, right? I mean, that's a long way down. That's a lot of concrete to pour. It needs a strong and sure foundation because foundations matter. Foundations matter when you're talking about buildings and foundations matter when you're talking about faith. And Paul begins this final chapter of kind of real instruction here in chapter 15 by emphasizing two foundations, or at least maybe in tandem they work as one foundation for the faith of a believer. And he doesn't use the language of foundation. That's I'm, I'm borrowing that language, but I think it makes sense. He points to Jesus himself, right? Jesus being a foundation, the centerpiece of, of our faith. But then he also uses Scripture over and over again in this chapter to validate, to back up, to corroborate that fact. Jesus and Scripture in tandem work as a foundation to our faith, I think Paul says here. So in chapter 15, let's, let's dive into that and, and kind of look at that in detail. He talks about unity in Christ. It's kind of the first thing that he brings up. So once again, I already pointed out, and you, you could see it yourself, the odd placement of a chapter break here between chapters 14 and 15. It, it's almost like the person who added chapters didn't know what they were doing, but I digress. Because what Paul says at the start here of chapter 15 flows perfectly from chapter 14. And he goes on to make his strongest appeal yet to unity, I think. He begins by reminding the strong here that they have an ethical obligation to look out for the weak. Of course, this does not mean that they're act of, you know, some older sibling rather, you know, ready to beat up those who are picking on the weak or anything like that. But what he's talking about is that the strong have to come alongside the weak and build them up. The way I thought of it was like a track team. So imagine there's a, there's a track team, and the coach says, hey, in the race today, nobody finishes until you all finish. And so what happens? Well, you get those who naturally run faster. I imagine Danny and Linda's granddaughter is probably one of those. She's going to finish ahead of the pack. But what if her track coach had said, hey, you don't finish until everybody else finishes? Well, when she gets to the end, what is she going to have to do? Go back and do what? Run alongside the rest of her team that's still trying to finish the race. To me, I think that's what Paul is saying to the strong here. Those who have it all figured out. Those who know that these special days and things like that don't really matter. Well, it's up to you to come alongside those, to go back and say, come with us. Not to just outpace them and say, well, we've left you behind eat my dust kind of language, right? It's not what Paul is envisioning for the church. But that's happened far too often in the church. Our conscience can be a heavy burden to live with at times, and that's why Paul says at the end of chapter 14 
to live according to your conscience. As Paul has in mind here, Jewish Christians who in their minds, in their hearts, they cannot toss aside what they've lived with their whole lives, and that being the Torah, their sacred scripture. They, they feel like they can't toss that aside. And Paul doesn't see this as a problem necessarily, at least not in and of itself. It has become a problem, though, because these Gentile Christians have come along and said, hey, Jewish Christians, just get over it. Get over yourselves and toss that aside. No, he's telling those Gentile Christians who are running ahead, come back, build up and encourage those who aren't where you are. Put aside your feelings of superiority. This idea that you have in your mind that you're somehow better than the others is wrong. So what is this? What is the basis for this exhortation from Paul? I mean, how could he possibly expect the Christians in Rome to follow through on this lofty ideal of actually looking out for each other, right? Who really puts other people first? Is Paul crazy? I mean, who does that? In your life, who really does that? Not a lot of people, I would guess. So does Paul really expect us to follow through on something like this? Yes. He absolutely does. And what's his foundation for that? Oh, because that's what Jesus did. That's what he says here. Jesus put other people first. Paul expects the strong to pattern their behavior after the Messiah, who did not, and I quote, come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Some of you probably recognize that quote. It's from the Gospels. In Mark chapter 10, to be precise, that's how Jesus is described. He came to serve and to give his life. And Paul says, that's, that's the foundation of your faith right there. And then Paul, perhaps somewhat curiously, quotes from Psalm 69 here and then gives three other quotations from the Old Testament as well. And he places the words of the psalm directly in Jesus' mouth, which is interesting because... We're told, if you go back and look at Psalm 69, that it's a psalm of David. That David probably wrote that psalm. So how can this be? Well, this was a very common thing to do uh, in the early church, actually, was to put some of these words into Jesus' mouth himself or to say that these were about Jesus. Kind of makes sense if you think about it. If Jesus is truly the living word of God, right, in the flesh, it makes sense that other things that we might call the Word of God perhaps came from Him, right? Or have something to do with Him. Also, Jesus is a direct descendant, not, not just a direct descendant, the direct descendant from David, right? So perhaps Psalm 69 is taken in this instance as a foretaste of what Jesus Himself would have to go through because in it, David describes the struggles that he's dealing with, with people all around him. Well, I think uh, I think Gene did a really good job of, of taking us into the mindset of Jesus in the moment leading up to his betrayal, right? Beset on all sides from people who are supposed to love him, from somebody who claimed allegiance to him and was betrayed. It kind of makes sense that Paul might put these words in Jesus' mouth. But why does he use this quote? Why not something different? What's he trying to communicate through it? Well, remember that he's specifically writing to the strong in this moment. And it seems like what Paul is doing is envisioning that if the Gentile Christians change their behavior to be like the weak, that if they, if they scale back this idea that, well, we've moved on from the, the petty things that, that you focus on, you weak-minded brothers and sisters, then there is a likelihood that they're going to be ridiculed and put down in Roman society. I think Paul sees that as a very real possibility. So Paul, what does he do? He connects them back to Jesus' suffering, the insults that he had to endure, and he, he's saying Jesus also endured insults. Go look at Psalm 69, because they didn't have the Gospels yet, right? Jesus couldn't say, hey, go read Mark, or go read Matthew, like we can do. So he had to draw from the Scripture that he knew, and that's what he's doing in this moment. And he's saying, just as Jesus suffered, you're probably going to suffer insults as well. You're going to have to learn to deal with that, Gentile Christian. You're going to have to learn to get over the fact that the Romans, your, your 
fellow country people may not like the fact that you follow Jesus. So he connects them to Jesus again, the first part of that foundation that I talked about. And then he connects them to that second part of the foundation, that is Scripture. So we would do well, I think, to heed Paul's emphasis here on the role of Scripture in our lives. Not just for the New Testament either. right? It's not just that Paul only had the Old Testament to draw from. It's that Paul truly and actually believed that the Old Testament had something to say to us. That it has something to teach us. That there's something there that we can gain by reading these old dusty scriptures that he pulls off the shelf and says, hey, take a look here. There's something to be learned. I think perhaps we ought to pay attention to the Old Testament just a little bit more, again, which is one of the reasons why I want to do a little bit of a journey through it again uh, starting next week. And then he transitions to talking about everybody, all people under the rule of Christ. So again, this section begins with Jesus. Paul encourages them to accept each other, not because it's polite and not because it's going to make Paul happy, although I'm sure both of those things are true. It it is polite to accept other people, to be accepting. And it probably would have made Paul very happy to know that that was happening. Instead, Paul says to accept each other because you have been accepted by Christ. In other words, Paul is saying something like, if Christ is willing to accept you with all of your faults, If Christ is willing to accept you with all of your messiness and all of your ridiculousness, then you certainly ought to be willing to accept each other. It's a very effective argument, I think, because all of us are ridiculous. All of us are messy. All of us have faults. And if you don't think you do, come meet me. And let's talk about those faults. Even even when there are disagreements between believers, we have an obligation to accept each other and treat one another as family. Not because it's going to make Paul happy. Not because it's the polite thing to do. I mean, that's that's what we often teach children. And that's what that's what we're teaching our children. Be, be polite. Be kind to each other. But there's something more deeply and fundamental about this. And that is, that's because that's what Christ did for us. And if Christ can do that for us, then we can do that for each other. And as Paul begins to close out this letter, he, he once again reminds the Roman Christians how he began the letter. That the gospel, this good news, in other words, the message of Jesus Christ, is for all people. For the Jew first, and also for the Gentile. And he says the same thing, same thing here, but in a longer format that he did in Chapter 1, the Messiah came as a servant to the Jews in fulfillment of the very promises that God gave thousands of years ago. He also came to the Gentiles so that they too have the opportunity to glorify God. And to, again, validate Paul's claims, he gives four different quotations from the Old Testament. Once again, his intention is to show how the Gentiles really, really actually were part of this whole plan from the very beginning. And so the Messiah's rule over this world includes all people, not just the Jews. And then he concludes this little section here in chapter 15 by praying for them for three things, for joy, for peace, and for hope. Or Yes, for joy, peace, and hope. And it's all done through the power of the Holy Spirit. I really like how, how Paul emphasizes that it's done through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he gives them this example of unity in chapter 15, which I think is really beautiful. We come to this section here in chapter 15 that shows us this great example. The Jerusalem church was struggling. Now, we don't know exactly with what. We do know that there uh, apparently were some poor Christians among them that needed help, probably widows uh, or, or other people who are unable to make a living. So again, we don't know completely why or how, but For whatever reason, they're low on their finances. Jerusalem was a large city. So I think it's easy to suppose that as more and more people began to join this movement, this new thing that's happening in Jerusalem, that there were poor people joining their ranks. And we know that many of them, uh, we we, we also know that many wealthy people were joining at the same time, but the fact remains that they're they're having this struggle. 
uh, you know, the, the few poor, the few wealthy people that are that are coming can't sustain everybody. So they need help. And the question is, is the church going to step up and take care of her people? And that's precisely what happened in this moment. Paul aided this effort by encouraging some of the very churches that he started to send relief funds to the church in Jerusalem. And notice that it's not just a practical request either, although that would be very good. So just recently, down in uh, oh, down in Haiti, right? We had this we had this situation where the church wanted to be able to buy up some property next to them, so that they could expand their their opportunities, right? So that they could reach more people, do more with the, the space that's around them. We got to participate in that, and not just because it's a nice thing to do. Again, it's not just for practical reasons. It's a very deep theological reason to help them, because we want. We want the gospel to spread. We want more people in Haiti to receive the message that Jesus is their hope, that Jesus is their their future. And Paul does the same thing here. This isn't just a practical relief effort, not just because it's good to send money to those who are in need, but he says the Gentiles realized that they owed something to their Jewish brethren because they are the very people that this whole thing comes out of. It kind of sends us back to that idea of the grafting in of the branches. right? The Gentiles weren't there in the beginning. Now they get to be a part of this. They owe something to these people. So the least they can do is to send money to help them. And I think sometimes sometimes sending money is a denigrated thing, like, oh, your church just sends money, huh? Nobody ever goes. Well, sometimes sending money is exactly what's needed. Sometimes the people who are local there, sometimes the people who grew up there and know that area are the better ones to take the gospel to the people who live there. Sometimes money is exactly what they need to get that job done. Now, does that mean in every circumstance we just need to throw money at the problem? Well, no. But money helps. And Paul knows that. and So that's why he's encouraged these Gentile Christians to step up to the plate and help out. And then in keeping with the theme of unity, he gives them this final warning. He urges the Roman Christians to block out the voices of dissension and division among them. Most likely, there were probably voices within and without in the church. It's an important warning even for our time, people. Unfortunately, there are always, always going to be people who sow discord within the church. There are always going to be voices outside of the church who attempt to tear it down. Our task is to block out those those voices and listen to the voices that really matter. And so I think this brings us full circle back to the foundation that Paul talked about in this chapter. Christ and Scripture. The voices we listen to are to the Messiah and to Scripture. If we focus on who Jesus was, what he did, what he said, and how he lived, and if we focus on Scripture, both the Old and New Testaments, then just like building a building with a strong foundation, we, too, will be secure. I think Jesus said it well at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7. He says the one who listens to his teaching and then obeys his teaching is like what? A wise man who built his house on a rock, built his house on a solid foundation, right? That's what Jesus is talking about. Sand isn't a good foundation. Most of us probably know that. Rock is a good foundation. If only it were that easy, right? I know it's not, right? Faith isn't just that easy. What do we say? It's easier said than done. Right? That's the, the turn of phrase we use a lot, and, and that's true. It is. It's, it's easier for me to stand up here and to tell you, hey, just listen to Jesus and just listen to Scripture. It's easy for me to say that. It's a lot harder to do in your life. That's why you're here. That's, that's the reason you come to church, to be reminded of that, so that you can learn how to do that better, so that you can encourage somebody sitting next to you and go, you know what, I'm struggling with that too. Maybe there's a way that we can build each other up as we both struggle through what we're dealing with. 
It'd be cool if the church acted like that, wouldn't it? That's why you're here. The church is pretty cool when you think about it. There's a lot to it. It's not just about showing up and punching your time card and leaving today. It is about being unified, being together, taking care of each other. So to conclude today, as we round out our our final time looking in Romans, probably not forever, but at least for now, as we spent 15 good weeks looking at this letter, just a couple of takeaways. If the church were truly unified, truly unified, do you think Sunday mornings would look different? I wonder how they might look different. Maybe they wouldn't, but I wonder if they would, if the church were truly unified. And then just just a kind of a general question. What did Paul write in Romans that's going to stay with you over the next few months? What's going to be bouncing around in your head and that you're going to be coming back to over the next few months as you think, wow, I, I need to be reminded of that again that Paul wrote about in Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 8, or whatever it is. What's going to be rattling around in your head. I hope I hope that you have something to take away from what Paul has said through these 15 sometimes long chapters because he's written a lot. And again, we've not been able to cover every single word. I hope there's something that's going to stick with you from what Paul says. And if there is, what is that? What are you going to take away from this letter? Good news is for all. I hope, I I pray that we can be, I think we do a pretty good job. I think we are a pretty unified body of believers here. I really do. Um, I I think we're pretty pretty good about that. But are there ways that we can be better? Yeah, probably. And that's up to us to think about those things and try to figure that out. How can we be maybe just a little bit better glued together, a little bit more in tune and in touch with each other as as we struggle through this life of faith together, as we're all on this journey, who's, who's behind that we need to go back and, and help bring along with us and walk with them instead of leaving them behind, saying, eat my dust? How can we do that better as a family of believers here? Those are the things, to me, from chapter 15 that I want to take away today. So if you have any of those needs that you want to bring before us today. That's, that's Again, that's why we come together, to be a church, to be a family that prays for each other, that encourages each other, so that we can walk on this journey of faith together, not alone, not facing the world all alone. So if you have any of those needs that you want to bring before us this morning, do so as we stand and sing.